This is a rerun of the first AC for Factory 7 workshop. I began by asking what everyone in the room thought were the qualities required of an accountant. What an accountant needs to be is a good communicator. To be a good communicator, you obviously need to have good interpersonal skills. But you also need to have something of substance to talk about, which means that you've got to be very good at analysis of whatever you're looking at. You've got to be able to do or be a critical analyst to reflect critically and to think critically. Because by being able to do that, be able to do those things, you can provide help and assistance to the people who rely on you as an accountant. Accountants obviously have specialist knowledge, the main piece of specialist knowledge of an accountant, the key one that distinguishes it from all other professions is skill in double entry bookkeeping. If you don't have that skill, if you can't do your debits and your credits, in the end, it's likely that you get caught out as an accountant. I was told a story by a person who runs a chartered accountancy practice in England. I was speaking to him about six months ago about his practice and he had two senior managers in the practice, both of whom were qualified English chartered accountants. But one of them could not do double entry and got in a complete mess because he couldn't, he couldn't explain the accruals that were going on. So double entry is a very important skill for accountants, not only because it enables you to understand what you're looking at and to be able to do what you're asked to do in terms of accruals adjustments, closing adjustments, year-end adjustments, but because people expect you to be able to do it. So if you can't explain how someone managed to make an adjustment to some values in, in the ledger, it won't be very easy to, to convince them about anything else. So you need that technical skill that all accountants have. Typically, it's not acquired as well as student, no matter how much accounting you do, how much double entry you do. Most people actually learn double entry properly when they have to actually do it for a living or in a real world situation. And during apprenticeship, that is something that no matter whether you're just specializing in audit or you're specializing in tax, you're specializing in answer reporting or even management accounting, you will ultimately end up acquiring that skill. The skill that you really need to work on um, all the time though is your, is your critical thinking skill. You've got to be able to see the things that you're expected to be able to understand and you've got to be able to understand them. You've got to find answers to things that are not obvious. You've got to think out of the box and learn how to do it. And you have to be good at communicating that, which means, for example, when you're working as a professional accountant, you don't keep your mouth shut. You push what you know and understand forward. Because that's what the people that you're working for want to hear. They want to hear if you can, for example, this happened to me once. I was in a meeting, of um, middle management meeting, I was working uh, in the gas industry as a systems accountant. And my boss was saying to another manager that he really wished he could get an assessment of two alternative projects that they were looking at. They, these were in projects involving, well, it was millions of pounds, um, big national projects. And he said, we don't have any expertise in doing that. And he was an accountant. Um, and I just uh, mentioned that I knew how to do that. And that in my work, I was using computer software that enabled me to run programs, write and run programs that could calculate net present value on two, on two projects. Now, if I hadn't done that, the projects would, would either have been one would have been chosen by Tosia Coy, or 
they would have moved on to other things and the two projects would have been shelved. It was that type of business. And that led to me getting promoted from my job as a systems accountant into being a senior management accountant. Just that one move. And the people that I, I trained with and all the accountants that I knew at the time, and I knew a lot of them because there were a hundred of us went to Edinburgh every uh, year, three times while we were training to be taught in classes by ICAS. We were all trained to be very outgoing and very um, quick to offer advice whenever it seemed it was needed. If we went on audits, we'd spent a lot of our time talking to the client, not buried in the account books, the ledgers or the computer systems. It was something that we had to do. And accountants, the successful ones, are like that. They don't hide. They're very forward. And what we learned was that this is what you need. Now, with accounting history, you learn those sort of skills because you're looking at the past and you can't possibly know everything about the past. Um, and I'm not talking in this case about 800 years ago, I'm talking about last week. You just don't know everything. So you've got to make connections between the evidence you can see. You've got to extrapolate the information you have to a situation where you can actually come to some sort of reasonable conclusion. And studying history of any type teaches you how to do that. Because if you don't do it, you'll never understand or learn anything. You'll guess all the time. You'll do as one of those two managers might have done with the two projects and just guess which one's going to be more successful and could end up being right or could end up losing the company several million pounds. In history, you have to use the evidence and then from the evidence, arrive at a logical conclusion. And the only way to do that is to think critically about the evidence you can see. Now you had three articles to look at this week. One was very short. Money is incredibly important. Um, if you can understand anything in any depth about how accounting or how bookkeeping was done up until about 1900, you need to understand about monies of account. I remember going at and presenting a, a research seminar about three years ago. I was talking about bookkeeping in 14th century Florence. And I came to a part in my presentation where I was just telling the audience about monies of account and they didn't believe a word I was saying. The senior professor in the room who was sitting right in front of me asked me a question, which wasn't a question, it was a rhetorical question. And it was basically, do you expect us to believe this? People don't understand about monies of account that the information that you see in a ledger up until almost the present day, those monies did not exist in many cases. They were a form of currency, ghost currency, not intangible currency that was used for bookkeeping purposes. It was also used for trade. In 14th century Florence, if you were going down the equivalent of the high street that you or Union Street, a big shopping street around the shopping mall, not that they existed, but if you were, all the prices that you'd see in the windows or in the corners or written on notices were monies of account. They weren't real money. And being aware of that, that they had to use money of account, that the account books that we, are look, we look at from the 14th century 
are full of columns of numbers, amounts of currency that does not exist. If you know that, then it helps to appreciate the scale of the problem that merchants had right up to the 19th century in trying to trade where there was insufficient, what's called specie, S-P-E-C-I-E, -E, um, coins to go around. You just couldn't. People did what they could to adjust to that. And one thing they did was they invented double entry bookkeeping. And by inventing it, they created a way whereby people could be paid through their account books or through the ledger of a bank. So you just had to tell your banker, put a hundred lire into that person's account, please. And so double entry bookkeeping, which was the method used, made that possible. And that's in a nutshell, and without going into any great details, how it was invented in next week, week two, you will learn a lot about that. The way that the course is organized involves obviously going through a whole series of articles and looking at the course textbook. The thing about the, the textbook is that it gives you the big picture in a sense about what are the issues you deal with when you're looking at um, history. What do you have to worry about when you're looking at a period of history and trying to understand it? And while it's written about medieval period, as, as you know from what I've already said, it's, it could apply to any period. One of the things that highlights is highlighted, or the thing that's highlighted, apart from the story about Ptolemyo and how it was all about politics and um, communication, and about it's really a, a, an object lesson in you to how society worked at that point, and also an eye opener about just how much people were able to communicate. Towards the end of that first chapter, it talks about bias in history. And it talks about nationalism being a problem that interferes with the ability to interpret. It mentions how historical studies and studies of history are very much framed by 19th century attitudes and concepts. And what happened was that people started doing history on a large scale, a significant scale in the, in the 19th century. People were doing studied history before that, but the, the numbers became significant in the 19th century, particularly the second half. And the way they looked at the past was very much informed by the present. And they would focus very much on things and try and see signals or signs of the present in the past. It made everything they looked at biased, biased towards the present. They weren't aware enough of what had actually been going on in the past. They weren't aware enough of context. And even though they knew a little bit about context, they tended, because they weren't sure about it, they tended just to focus on, well, we do that this way now, we'd expect them to do it that way then. So that resulted in a lot of history being written, particularly, in, in, to be honest, in the early 20th century in accounting. Accounting history uh, in the first 20 years of the 20th century, very much like that. Another thing was periodization of history is very Anglo-centric. Very much looking at what history was to the British. Industrial Revolution, for example, the dates given for that, which are roughly 1770 to 1840. That is very much a British thing. Medieval period, very European. The concepts, the thoughts about what, what took place in the European period up to 1500, which is when it ends in the medieval period. Um, it's very much focused on what people think 
society was like in Western Europe during that time. The fact that in India, China, Scandinavia, Africa, many other parts of the world, there was a different type of society, a different evolution within the society, different things were going on, and they didn't really have the same period as we have because they were never part of the Roman Empire. There's also a problem in historical work about whether or not there was a Middle Ages. The historians have basically decided there was. Remember these um, Anglo Anglophile, English language dominated, English thinking dominated, European perspectives. Was the Middle Ages? Who knows? But we know the Roman Empire finished. We know that there wasn't so much um, activity of the type that may be going on then, we think, because of, actually we don't know that much about it, Roman times, but there was an assumption that when it finished, everything stopped for a bit. So you went into Dark Ages, as the first it's part of the Middle Ages. But it's all conjecture. There may never have been a Middle Ages. It may, it may have continued as it was, just with different rules, different rulers, and so on. And then finally, and the most important thing to understand when you're looking at medieval history is were medieval people like us? If you assume they were like us, then it makes this way of looking at history from the present, where you assume everything was like the present, makes it more robust. It doesn't make it correct or more correct. But there is an assumption to, to a large extent that people in the medieval times thought as we would have thought. So if we were there at that time, we would interpret it the way we would interpret it today. Therefore, we can assume that people thought like we did. They behaved like we did. And that's true of medieval period, but it's also true of early modern period, period up to between 1800 and 1850, somewhere in there. So that's basically what the chapter was about. But then uh, I was asking about the articles, the other two articles, and Article 3 seemed to be one that and everyone in the room seems to have done Article 3. No one admitted to doing Article 1, which was disappointing because Article 1 is every bit as important to you as Article 3. Article 3 is about medieval trade in Europe, obviously, um, and accounting, and the role and diffusion of double entry. And one uh, of the students, Phoenix, gave me her summary which uh, looks like this. And I read out bits of it. One of the things that she wrote was that the method of research used in this article is secondary research in the form of a literacy review, and it certainly was. It's only possible to carry out secondary research on this topic due to the nature of it being a historic topic. In the case of this article, it, that is exactly correct. Well, primary accounts, primary sources, that is, would be great. It is not possible. Again, that's correct. In this particular article, it states that a lot of primary sources from the time are written in Italian. So these will have to be translated, which will be time consuming, which obviously also impacts the ability to use it, particularly if you've not got a long time to do it. Now, what I wrote about that was in terms of the design methodology approach, which is what that was about. I said it's a district, dis, descriptive study, relying on secondary sources, mainly from the disciplines. I'm saying exactly the same as Phoenix said, but in a different way. It it critically reflects on the implications of what has been found by scholars from other disciplines for the accounting history literature, or upon the accounting history literature. And I wrote 30 words. The amount that you're advised to write is 100.
100, sorry, one. And the point I've, I made then was that those numbers that you've been given are just guidelines of what you might be expected to write. But you don't have to write that much as long as you cover it. We initially didn't write 100 words either. Maybe 75. Um, I looked at something else, which I'll come to in a minute. Let's take one of the other things, originality, value, 100 words, recommended. Also, it was uh, whether was many sources referred to in this article, there was also much unreferenced, i.e. original idea. When a topic, for a topic which does not have a lot of material available on it, this will add a good amount of value and information into the bank for others to use. It's perfectly valid points to make. What I wrote on the same theme, originality value, this is the first study to address that claim, the claim that double entry bookkeeping only finally gained widespread adoption in the 19th century. That's its originality. We, I was focusing really, Phoenix was sort of focusing more towards the value part. You see, we're not exactly saying the same things on this particular aspect of the summary you asked to prepare, which is not wrong, and I'm not wrong. So there is no right answer, really. It's a case of putting down your thoughts on a piece of paper about what you've just read. And in doing that, you begin to, you almost are forced to begin to think critically. And that is the whole point in doing this exercise. It's that you critically reflect on what you've read by directing your thoughts at the most important issues. And that's the list of seven points. The final thing I mentioned was the very last thing you asked about. Unsupported assertions. Why are these unsigned? Venus wrote that accounting history differs from the north and the south of Europe. This is unsighted due to the accounting history literature being silent on this account. Well, that's a very good point. There is nowhere in the accounting history literature that the north versus the south it has been highlighted. It's just assumed that all of Europe was the same. So you wouldn't expect any citations to support that statement. And you can justify it for the point that no one's ever written about it. The all that's been written about North and South is in the economic history literature, not the economic history literature. There's other things mentioned but they, by, by uh, Phoenix, but I'll just go on to what I wrote about that. The following assertion on page nine is not supported by a citation. Pacioli's manual is revered in the accounting history literature, but criticized because it does not explain how to make end of period adjustments and does not fully explain how to prepare statements of profit and loss and balance sheets. There is no citation because the next sentence addresses the point about criticism and sources are provided that likely support the assertion about criticized. So the Sentence I was quoting, Bachelet's manual is revered in the account history literature, but criticized because, the criticized because, which was not supported by a site, is covered by what comes in the next few sentences and by the sources for those. However, the revered assertion, Bachelet's manual is revered in the account history literature. However, the revered assertion is not supported, possibly because it is generally known to be true. And that's what you should be doing. So you're looking at the article other than in the abstract introduction, introduction to see if there's anything being stated as if it's a fact, but, uh, but for which no evidence has been provided to that point to support the statement. Both what Phoenix wrote about the North and South and what I wrote about in my summary about Pacioli's manual is revered, they're not supported. She gave an explanation for the North and South, which is a perfectly valid explanation. I gave an explanation for the manual being revered, which is also valid. And what, what, what I was doing, and what to a less extent Phoenix was doing, because it's actually implicit in the text, but what I was doing in my summary, I was taking what was written in the paper and I was thinking about 
what I knew about that person. And because I knew something about that person, Luca Pacioli, I knew that the explanation I gave was, was probably right. So basically what I'm saying is and what I said was, this is all that you need to write when you summary. In my sections, for the 200 word section seven, I had 190. Originality was 100 words. I had about 20. The findings, which were 100, I had 128. Design, methodology, approach, I had 31. The purpose, 100 words is recommended, I had 18. And the summary description, for which 200 words are expected, I had 291. So you just take these numbers as indicators. If you can write uh, the summary or description in 50 words instead of 200, fine. It takes you 400, fine. If you write 10 words on research limitation or implications, fine. The important thing is you try and do it. And if you didn't try and do it this week, you will find it increasingly difficult to keep doing it because this is meant to be an iterative process. So that the, you learn a little bit about the techniques in the first week. You learn more in the second week. You learn more in the third week. So each week you're getting better and better and better. If you don't start, you'll never get good enough. And when it comes to your project, this is skill you need. You need to be able to do this um, in order to achieve a good grade in your project. Finally, the last thing I think I talked about was speculative history. When you have a piece of knowledge, a piece of information, a piece of, you all, you know what's going on over there, right? So you've got a bit of knowledge and information about that. You've got a bit of knowledge and information about that. And you put these two things in front of you. So they are like there, over there, and over there. And you need to get some way, put something between them so that they join up. You've got to find a way of bridging that gap. When historians come to a point like that, it's like coming to a river and it's got one end of the bridge at your side and one end at the other side and nothing between. You've got to find a way of connecting them together. And what the historian does is he or she looks at everything that's going on, at the context all around, looks at all of the, that it, all that is known about the period, about the, the situation, about everything that's relevant. And on the basis of all that contextual information, forms an opinion about how that side of the river relates to this side, or how this piece of information here can be connected to this piece of information there. And that is that gap that's filled through the speculation. As long as it is logical, based on the evidence, and it provides an explanation that is reasonable in the circumstances, that fits with everything that is known, which if everything was known would be a good answer, then it's sound historical work. The example I gave was in paper one concerning the auditors in Florence, the bank auditors. Auditors have existed for almost as long as uh, accounts have been kept. But anyway, the Bankers Guild was formed at the end of the 12th century. So it's somewhere between about 1194 and 1202. It was formed by the three biggest guilds because they had nowhere to put all of the gold that they'd been receiving from the north in their trade. And they needed somewhere that would function in a way that would facilitate trade taking place. So they created a banker's guild, effectively they sponsored it. And as part of the sponsorship or creation of the guild, a guild had a set of regulations created called statutes. And every guild had statutes, so the banker's guild had statutes as well. 
we have a copy that has survived of the statutes of the guild from the end of the 13th century. We know there was a, a set of, of uh, statutes for the guild about 20 years earlier, but has not survived. And we know that when the guild was formed, it would have had statutes because they all did. And the paper that's written, paper one, took that piece of knowledge where we knew the statutes at the end of the 13th century, but not at the beginning. And in the paper, it states the statutes have survived and it is believed that they have not been changed very much since they were first developed when the guild was formed. And that enabled me to take the fact that there were auditors, because the statutes talk about the bank auditors, that there were auditors at the end of the 13th century and transfer it back into the end of the 12th century and say that the bank auditors were in operation then too. And that was what enabled the whole paper to work. Without that piece of speculative history where I took one fact from the end of the 13th and joined it to the fact, a different fact, the end of the 12th, and joined them together. By doing that, that paper was possible. We could write it. And that was speculative history. It used the evidence that was available to create a plausible explanation for what had taken place, which was the invention of double entry bookkeeping as we know it that marked the beginning of modern accounting. Without the speculation, that paper could not have been written. And historians do that all the time. They speculate, they join up the dots, not typically over a century, but it does happen. And sometimes it can be even longer than that. And at that point, we'll cease, we'll stop what we're doing.